just a sample. It's Seeing Red Live on Championship Sunday. You're watching Seeing Red's 90-minute live preview from right here at beautiful Red Bull Arena, where later today the Eastern Conference Championship will be decided between the New York Red Bulls down 2 nothing, taking on the Columbus Crew. I'm joined, as always, by my erstwhile Seeing Red host, Eric Giacometti. Dan Nickinson. Dan, how you doing today? I'm doing all right, Mark. Yeah, Eric, ready to rock and roll? Yeah, happy to be here. Let's do it. We are all happy to be there. Of course, tonight uh, a conference champion will be crowned and one berth in MLS Cup will be determined. And you may hear later today a little bit of uh, noise in the back as they practice exactly what's going to happen. If you want to interact with us at any time during the show, please use hashtag SRLive. And we're watching on our magic internet machines and we'll be pulling down your best questions and answering them live on the show. We're on YouTube, we're on NewYorkRedBulls.com, and for the first time, we're at TuneIn on the New York Red Bulls audio streaming network. And if you haven't downloaded the TuneIn app on your mobile device, we strongly encourage you to do just that. Our guest today at Seeing Red, we're going to have former Metro star and New York Red Bull, that's Steve Jolly joining us here, one of the voices of Red Bulls Radio. We'll have Frank Giassi, longtime columnist, uh, coverage man for the New York Red Bulls at NJ.com, the Star Ledger, and now at NewYorkRedBulls.com. And we'll have the MLS Coach of the Year, the New York Red Bulls coach. That's Jesse Marsh. So last Sunday, Eric, New York goes in. They're, uh, they're girding for a big battle, and everything changed real fast. Yeah, it seems like the Red Bulls were usually the ones that would you know, get the early goal. Tim Cahill did it, Mike Grillo did it, and then they concede nine seconds in. So you can't really ask for a much worse start than that. And then you know, right at the end of the match, they could have got out of there with a, with a pretty decent result with 1-0. And they, you know, Kai Kamara gets the better of them, gets the, gets the second goal. And uh, that really sets the tempo for this one. They have a big hole to climb now. They have to avoid getting an away goal for Columbus tonight, keep the clean sheet, get two goals. It's definitely a tough task. That's right, Dan. So when you think about the total performance that we saw out of the Red Bulls at Mafray Stadium last week, what does this team need to do differently and what do they need to do better to flip the script here and walk away the Eastern Conference champs? Well, I think the easy answer is to not give up a goal in nine seconds because that <laughs> and it, it, it's funny, but it also clearly unnerved them. It took them a good 30 minutes to really get back in the game and they looked a lot more on the ropes early in that game than they ended up being until the, that late goal from Kamara. Um, I, I think the key for this game is going to be them playing looser, playing free. Um, you know, they, they don't have to worry about the yellow card accumulation this time. That's right. They are at home or they've been great, and they can come out and, you know, as the team has said, they'll play the way they want to play, and they are going to have to put on a, a one of the best performances of the year to get out of this without conceding that away goal to Columbus, but they seem to be up to the task. Of course, 25,219 tickets have been sold for this match. It is completely sold out. If you are coming to Red Bull Arena later this afternoon, we ask a few things. First, we ask that you come early. And the reason that you come early, should come early tonight is that there are uh, heightened security measures for this match. And if you're not sure what you can bring or not bring into the stadium tonight, please go to NewYorkRedBulls.com and take a look. Uh, it's very, very different from any sort of regular season match in terms of what's allowed. Um, to go over the scenarios of what New York has to do to win this match and to move on, not just win the match, but win the series and move on to the conference finals, a 2 nothing win by the Red Bulls today pushes them into extra time, again, reversing the, the, result, the result that we saw last week in Columbus. If Columbus scores because they would have the away goals tiebreaker, and of course uh, New York was unable to score a goal last week, then New York would have to get to four goals scored in this game. A 3-1 win by the Red Bulls is not good enough 
despite an impressive result against a, a quality side. However, Dan, let's start here. Mm. There were a lot of times this season that New York got results, whether home or away, that would deliver this particular result. Definitely. And, you know, people who have been watching the team this year will remember those results because they were uh, very fluid attacking and, and the goals came quickly and often think about the new england game on july 11th where it was three goals inside of the first i think 12 minutes um you think back to uh open cup games against atlanta and the cosmos three nothing against atlanta four one against the cosmos um you had a, that four one against philly with that quick goal from mike Rella, uh, at home in october they, they've had so many of these results that i think that's the reason you can you can keep that hope that they can pull out the result today yeah. And now Columbus away had actually matched New York's record six, seven, and four on the season. Uh, they were minus eight on the road. They're they're not a strong road team. Quality draws: Vancouver, New England, Orlando, RSL. The interesting quirk is all the draws came before June twenty seventh, and then they had a terrific closing road record, going six and two on the road after that. After July fifteenth, they only lost here on October 3rd against the Red Bulls, and they did have a loss at Orlando. Wins on the road down the stretch, Chicago, Colorado, in the Bronx, Philly, D.C., and TFC. I'm curious, the two times, Eric, that uh, Columbus has beaten New York this season, they, they kind of went a little bit against their character, didn't really play the same game that New York played. They went direct, and they won. They know that a goal here and an early goal for all intents and purposes, ends the series. How are they going to come out knowing that, you know, are they going to bunker? Are they going to come and play? What do you think we're going to see from the crew today? Well, that's that's just the question. I mean, there's two very distinct ways that can go about this, and I asked Jesse Marsh and a bunch of the players this week, and they're not really too sure either, but it, they're not really concerned either way. But the crew, they can sit back, they can absorb some pressure, try to, you know, hold on to their lead, but that's I don't think that's really what they do best, so I wouldn't expect them to just bunker for 90 minutes. If, if they were to, you know, go forward and try to get the uh, an early goal, maybe put this high to reach, that would be along more along the lines of what Greg Berhalter has been preaching. They have a very specific style and how they like to play much like the Red Bulls do and uh, they were able to execute better on the night last Sunday so if they're able to do it again today get an early goal they could really put this one out of reach they certainly could New York at home a stellar record 12-3-2 and an all-time team mark in terms of wins at home in the season plus 17 goal differential on the road the draws early in the season at LA and Colorado the losses to Vancouver to Philadelphia, which was the most baffling loss of the season, and then Kyle Lahren doing his thing uh, in the 5-2 win down the stretch. They do have a four-match home winning streak, including the playoffs. And Dan, what is it about playing in, in this arena in front of these crowd, uh, in front of a sellout crowd, that's going to make this um, a reason to feel optimistic if you're a Red Bulls fan? Well, I think the team has always thrived off the energy of the crowd, and particularly the South Ward, because when this arena gets loud, it's one of the loudest in the league from my experience. Um, I, I think they know how the field plays very well. I think they're, they're used to, you know, they, they've built this into a fortress. So I think they, they will definitely gain a home advantage out of this today. For sure. New York 0-4 all-time in the postseason against Columbus in 1998. Brian McBride scored a brace in the first 20 minutes of the game in New York, or rather, New York went down. The Metro Stars went down 5-3 after goals by uh, Eduardo Hurtado, Mike Sorber, and Miles Joseph. And then they lost in a penalty kick shootout 1-1 in the second game of that series. The last penalty kick was sent wide by Giovanni Savarisi. Talk about some ancient history. Of course, there was the 2008 3-1 uh, loss in MLS Cup, and then last week against uh, against the crew at Maffray. Eric, is is there the notion that Columbus is some kind of bogey team in the postseason? We've talked in previous years about getting the D.C. Albatross off of New York's back, and yet here we have New York unable to take care of Columbus in four tries in postseason. No, I, I really don't think there's too much to it. I mean, this is a team that's they've, they've broken curses before. You know, they, they got their first win in Chicago to win the Shield. Uh, even last year, the team got their 
first win in New England. So history, you know, as long as this history is 20 years for this franchise, it doesn't dictate too much of what is going to go on today. Uh, you know, Columbus is obviously a very talented team, but uh, between the lines, it's going to be about what this 2015 Red Bulls team can do. So I wouldn't read too much into the past results. Well, and past results is something that, that we'll consult, nevertheless. Um, since 2003, when the home and away format went into place for MLS playoff series, the first leg winner has won the series 27 times. The first leg loser has only won 15 times. And, of course, 15 times the, the first match ended in a draw as well. When the first leg winner wins by two or more goals, only twice in MLS Cup playoff history has a team come back from that sort of deficit and it last happened 11 years ago in 2004 so um, New York is definitely going to try and make a little history of course it'll be history if the Red Bulls are able to pull it off it's their first Eastern Conference Championship of course longtime fans of the team will know that in 2008 Dave Vanderberg delivered in this game to send them to the Western Conference title um, where they played this same Columbus crew. The lineups should not be radically different. Of course, the crew will be uh, buoyed a little bit by the return of Gaston Saro uh, from yellow card suspension. Saro joined the club on August 6th from Basel. He's a player with both Champions League and Europa League experience. He's played four times for the crew, and he did play 90 minutes um, in that match. Dan, is there anything that New York is going to do differently now that they're facing Saro rather than Tyson Wall, who frankly played very well against New York in leg one? I, I don't think the game plan changes much, and certainly we'll hear from Jesse later in the show. But, you know, th this team has a style that they like to stick with, and I don't think it matters the center back pairing, the, the full backs, who's in the midfield. They're, they're going to press, and they're going to press hard. Kai Kamara, three goals in three MLS playoff games, and what may have been the easiest goal of his life at the end of uh, leg one in Columbus. New York has scored two goals, period, in three playoff games. Eric, uh, as we get ready to close out this first segment, what has to happen differently? How are they going to contain Kamara in this leg? Well, they've got to put a body on him. That's the, the key. He's such a physical striker. That he can impose his will in the box, and he's, he's just so good at so many different things. He can beat you airily. He can beat you off the dribble. Uh, so they're going to have to get in his face. I think Ronald Zubar matches up with him pretty nicely, another physical player. Uh, they can match up strength for strength there. So, And if they can cut off uh, the service from the wings between Merrim and Finley, I think that'll go a long way to shutting down Kamara tonight. Of course, Mabwadi with the, the mazy dribble in the box that uh, froze most of both teams watching that uh, nice piece of skill before crossing over to Kay Kamara. When we come back on Seeing Red Live, we're going to talk to Steve Jolly, longtime defender of this team and now member of Red Bulls Radio, who'll help us preview the match. We'll be right back after this. Now, Sean Wright Phillips trying to respond. Fired it low. Bradley puts it in. The Wright Phillips connection does it again. The Red Bulls right back in front one minute later. What a response from the New York Red Bulls. Well, I don't think anybody can question now what this combo of Wright Phillips brothers are going to be doing for this uh, Red Bull team going forward. Again, Sean Wright Phillips doing a great job maintaining possession is able to lift his head, spot his brother inside the six-yard box who one touches it into the net. Jesse Marsh calls over Perinel and Felipe to give instructions. There aren't any timeouts, and Ishmael Elfath is right in his face. Said one more time, if you leave your technical area, I'm throwing you out. I'm just reading uh, body language, and Ishmael Elfath was very clear with his hands. One more, you're out. Red Bulls on the attack. Kemar Lawrence played it low and fell to Wright Phillips, and the Red Bulls are in front. Three games against New York City. Four goals for Bradley Wright Phillips. Red Bulls won. City nothing. And just like that, as we have been speaking about time and time again here in the first 20 minutes, it's outside. The Red Bull finds the most success. Finally, Lawrence gets forward on the left-hand side. Serves a great ball. 45-degree ball. It's Mena who misses that touch. Unfortunately for Wright Phillips, left alone. Has an e easy finish, one touch. Josh Saunders, nothing he could do about that since Mena missed an obvious, obvious clearance. New York Red Bull soccer will return live momentarily. Another turnover 
against this stretched New York City team. Grella nutmegs Lampard. The layoff went wide. Lampard took him down at the same time. Now Felipe fires it low, and Felipe puts the icing on the cake. He hit the post last week. He's just put the Red Bulls in sole control of New York metropolitan area soccer. Red Bulls two, New York City FC nothing. Well, Jonathan, I mentioned how fatigue is set in, or at least it looked like it was setting in on NYCFC, and that's exactly what happened is Ariola just gave Felipe way too much time on the ball, and he's able to slip it into the near post against Josh Saunders, giving Red Bull in the 85th minute a 2 nothing lead. Almost a giveaway to Grella. It's Laid who's able to step up and win it. Immediately into the final third. Served across. Bradley Wright Phillips is there with the header, takes it down, and New York has a 2 1 lead. We're back at Seeing Red Live before the New York Red Bulls take on the Columbus Crew in leg two of the Eastern Conference Championship. Kickoff at 7 30 on Fox Sports 1. Our first guest today on Seeing Red Live is uh, is a man who, frankly, lead, needs little introduction. Only six men have played more for the Red Bulls and Metro Stars over their careers. Steve Jolly was a member of the 2000 team that went to the Eastern Conference Finals, as well as the 2003 team that went to the U.S. Open Cup Final. He's a current commentator on Red Bulls Radio, which you can hear live later on TuneIn. Steve Jolly, welcome to Seeing Red. How are you Thanks doing? Thanks for uh, making me feel real old there, buddy. <laughs> Appreciate that. Dude, I just hit 40, and it already feels deep right now. Yeah, there <laughs> it feels you go. really deep. I've got the gray beard yeah. here. Um, talk to us a little bit about what an elimination game is like as a player and what you go through as you prepare to take the field knowing that it might be the yeah. last game of the season. How do you get mentally prepared, and how is that different from a regular season game? That's a good one. That's a really good one because, you know, I think uh, Jesse probably alluded to it better than anybody else in the last week when he said the, the combination between urgency and panic because uh, that becomes really important. You see the best players who really thrive in these kind of env environments understand the difference between urgency and panic. Um, those players that really struggle and, you know, quite frankly, we saw that a little bit in the first leg yes. are the people who don't understand that they need to settle down, play their game and rely on what, you know, has brought them there. And uh, and so for the next stage and the, for these type of games, it's usually the teams who understand their role and responsibilities and the players who understand their roles and responsibilities and feel comfortable and confident about that are the teams that excel and the players that excel in these kind of environments. So this, this Red Bulls team is as close as any to getting uh, to an MLS Cup final, and you, you guys in 2000 were very close as well. Can you just talk us through that, that game in Chicago in, uh, in, in 2000? Uh, uh, I'm still <laughs> scarred by it. Thank <laughs> you for bringing that one up. You know, 2000 was unique because, as you're probably well aware, in 1999, they struggled a little bit. And then quite a few players, new players came on board, yeah. um, and a lot of young players. I mean, at that, con that time, you know, obviously Mike Pecky was still pretty young, Daniel Hernandez, Clint Mathis, me, and then they sprinkled some really, really good players, i.e. Tab Ramos of the world. And, uh, and we excelled, and I don't think anybody expected that sort of like this team. Uh, you know, and th at that point, I think we were just trying to get through the idea of, um, you know what, this team is probably better than we even thought we were. And the history has probably proven that a little bit, too. And, uh, and I, I think it was the combination of just seeing, you know, Ante Razo score his goal and, and just how they scored. We, we felt like we had something special. But uh, at the same token, I think we were a little blind, like deer in the headlights a little bit, because we didn't really know and we weren't really properly guided to, to expect that kind of success. So you were on the field, obviously, when Valencia scores what should have been, yeah. uh, in by some accounts, uh, the series <laughs> winner sending New York to MLS Cup. Talk to us about how that call changed the momentum of the game. Um, you know, I don't remember much of that game, partly because I've had so many concussions. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, you know, he, here's the one thing I do recall by the, the big experience of those playoffs is what I said before, is the deer in the headlights. I don't know, it, and it was a combination of maybe the leadership, the younger players, the coaching staffs, the organization. I do not think if we can constructively be critical of ourselves, like properly prepare ourselves to, to have that expectation. And that's partly one of the reasons why I you know, kind of really rallied behind Jesse is because he's prepared all these players that this is the expectation, is that you are to get to the MLS Cup. If you do not get to the MLS right. Cup, then you've let yourself down. And, and that's partly one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of Jesse is because he's properly prepared these guys for doing their job and given them all the, um, the attributes not to have that quote-unquote panic. 
And, uh, and then now it's up to them to step it up. It's, you know, when the whistle's blown, it's time for them to, to truly, uh, you know, I guess they do, you make money, and this is for a reason when you're right. playing professional sports. And, and those who uh, don't do their jobs will uh, un unfortunately have a reckoning in the offseason. Steve, everybody saw the performance in Columbus last week, and I think everybody wants to see better this time. What does New York have to do differently to get the result tonight? You know, for me, and I don't know if this is, you know, the overarching public opinion of this, but I think the, f the four defenders are the key aspect of this game. I know we talked about how great the center, you know, midfield is, and obviously Wright Phillips and, you know, Lloyd Sam has done exceptionally with Mike Grella. When I say the four, I'm saying, and I've kind of preached on this all ever, about just every game, people do not realize how important it is for outside backs to get forward and how that opens up the games. So the outside backs getting forward more offensively than anything else. And then the center backs, when called upon, do your job. You don't need to be a hero in terms of possession or anything like that. You just win the individual battles. And unfortunately, Zubar in the first nine seconds didn't win his individual battle and caught everybody a little off guard in terms of how they needed to move. And that's what it's all about when you're a center back. It's not, you don't really need to be a hero. You just need to win the ball. And for Zubar, and I think that's my big, if there's one player that I'm watching tonight, it's Zubar. He was brought in as that veteran leader. And for me, I don't know if I can say that he stepped up to the call so far in 2015. Steve, you... you was, that, was that too critical? Because uh, <laughs> I'm okay with that because that's my job to be critical. <laughs> I just want to make sure that everybody understands that that's the player I'm kind of focusing on tonight. I think, I, think that, I think you've made that pretty clear, Steve. Thanks. <laughs> when you talk about your playing career, many, many years in MLS for a couple of different teams, obviously most of your time was spent uh, here in New York. Um, who were the guys that you were lined up with that you know that you were going to have a, a challenging day? I don't want to say a tough day because I think, you yeah. know, by and large, you won a lot of those battles. But who were the players? I mean, when you look at a guy like Kamara, obviously, yeah. he's a focal point of an offense. When you think back on your career, who were the guys that you uh, were very much aware have needed to be on your good day? I think, uh, you know, and this is probably, and I'm speaking only on behalf of me, is that I usually had problems with guys who ran at me. Okay. Those were the most dangerous players. Guys that kind of relied on their athleticism, the, the, the Brian McBrides of the world who felt like they could outjump me, never really won out those battles. It was the guys who turned and ran at me that caused some pain. And, uh, you know, when Diallo was in Tampa Bay, he was very difficult to play because he was just like stormtrooper, just goes in. Right. So those were the players that I probably had the most struggle with. The players who are more technically minded, like the Ante Razovs of the world, I didn't really have too much fear, especially players that were focused on just their left foot or the right foot. I felt like I was smart enough and athletic enough to kind of to, to, to handle those players. It's the, the athletic ones that kind of turned and ran at you. The Landon Donovans of the world is a perfect example. He's not going to you know, outrun you all the time, but when he, he can outrun you with the ball at his feet, and that's what, you know, those were the dangerous players. Uh, not, not to harp on your age too much here again, but you, you've been out of the Appreciate league. Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> You're going to say I've been out of the league for a long, long time. You've been time. out of the league for, for a fair amount of time, and we've, we've seen a lot of growth within MLS, and you would know it just as, uh, as good as anyone. What have you seen in, you know, a, a league that's only 20 years old, what have you seen in the way that the league has come forward? Yeah, uh, man, it's, it's like night and day. I mean, remember, well, first of all, and we, my wife and I joke about this. When, when I first got drafted, it was the idea of, hey, maybe I'll do this for a couple of years and then go get a real job. <laughs> and that was even for a first-round pick, you know, even saying that. Then it was, you know, back in the whole 98, 99 of, we don't even know if this league is going to be around. Right. And then having that natural evolution of the stadium in Columbus and then Home Depot Center and then, you know, even when I worked for the league, uh, you know, seeing just the, just the sheer growth of the, the – the league and, and what they was doing internationally and then now 20 years i just hope that people put some perspective in this and that's what i've kind of stressed over 20 years remember this league is only 20 years old there's been billion dollars of commercial you know development around this league this league has grown faster than any league in the entire world and i'm not talking about leagues just soccer i'm talking about all sports and if they can put in that in perspective and just see the like the natural kind of evolution and revolution that this sports is happening i think people would be pretty thankful and I'm using that in terms of timing, in terms yes. of Thanksgiving, because, yes. you know, I had the luxury of playing in the early, the first, you know, 10 years of the league. And I had been able to still be involved and engaged in the last 10 years because of, you know, people who had the fourth. You, know, you think about the hunts and the ant shoots that stuck in there when nobody else was sticking there. Right. And that's 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 what I'm talking about perspective. There's two or three guys there that said, you know what, I'm putting my uh, my wallet down to save the future of this the sport, which I think is pretty remarkable. Yep.
Definitely. You you talked a little earlier about the the difference between the 2000 team and and the system that Jesse is running and and building off that MLS question. What sort of changes have you seen in the club itself? Yeah. Well, I. That is a really difficult question. So you're going to give me some time to think about yeah, it, sure. <laughs> Obviously, the whole Red Bull dynamic has changed everything. Um, beyond the, I mean, when you think about professionalism, defined objectively professionalism, I mean, we went to a situation where it was an absolutely atrocious turf field yeah. in a stadium that really nobody cared about. With that much, you know, the people that were passionate and coming, which we were very thankful of, but having 9,000, 10,000 people in a stadium for a playoff game is a lot different than having 25,000 sold out in your own soccer-specific stadium. We'll just say that. Um, so that's where the, I think the biggest differences are because, you know, this league has become more professional, and the players themselves have become more professional. You know, I used to kind of be laughed at because I used to take offseason just as serious as – you know, the, the on season. And that's partly one of the reasons why, listen, I wasn't that great of a soccer player, but I just <laughs> outworked everybody and I was pretty athletic and I treated myself and my body exceptionally well in the off season, just much as did on season. It saved me. Right. It really literally saved me. And now these guys get it. And it might be an economic thing, meaning they make more money, but it might be as simple as just everybody is prof you know, becoming more and more professional. So we're going to put you in the spotlight more, more than the spotlights that I we have here that. in the press box. I know, I know you're a spotlight kind of guy. New York is <laughs> I down. I don't know how to take that one. New, but York, okay. <laughs> New York is down 2 nothing at yeah. halftime of the series. They need to win 2 nothing just to get to yeah. overtime. What's your prediction about what we might see later today? Well, I like the whole idea of the 2 nothing kind of theme, and I'm, I'm saying that because this is a, a team that uh, – in Red Bull, I think it's over like 21 games. I think they've scored more than two goals this year. And then there's been over 20-plus games where Columbus has let up two goals. I don't think it's going to be as simple as 2 nothing. I know Major right. League Soccer know enough that it's, <laughs> it's never going to be that, inch, uh, that, that simple. But do I see a 3-1 game and going into extra time? I think everybody kind of Well, they're going to you know, need 4-1 to get extra time. 4-1 because 3-1 yeah. would, have, would have brought in the away goals. Right. But that, doesn't, that wouldn't shock me if, if we go into extra, extra time. Other than Zubar, is there another player that you see as the difference maker for the Red Bulls today? Can I just say Zubar? Because <laughs> it re it's, really it's really that simple for me, to be honest with you. I mean, I think th when you look at the last game, I don't think there was one player that you could say played exceptionally well. And yeah. I think they all have taken responsibility in that. It's just for me, and I don't, maybe it's because I'm framing it as a guy who used to play defense. You know, Zubar was brought in as a starter. And it just so happened that Paranel stepped up and did his job. And obviously Miazga has been exceptional. But when you're called in and you have basically haven't played as many games as he, you think he would play, right. and you're that veteran player, it's that you're not going to be playing under panic. You're going to be controlled, disciplined, and lead this team. And I don't know if I've seen that. And, and you know, it's not that I'm trying to be harsh on the guy. It's just that you, he's old enough to handle this. And if he's not can't handle it, then he shouldn't be here. So, again, your prediction. I don't know if we got your <laughs> prediction. I, 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 we heard a few yeah. results, but what, what's going to happen today? Uh, uh, that's tough. That's tough. <laughs> We're here to ask the tough yeah, questions, yeah. Steve. You know, you know I'll, I'll, I'll keep it simple and do the 2-0 and just go into extra time. And then when extra times, I, I genuinely feel like this is a better team and that they'll, they'll rise to the occasion. They've done that all season. Um, this is a team, I think, to some degree, has a little bit of destiny in them, and I'd be shocked if they don't go to the next round, and I'd love to see them host an MLS Cup. Steve Jolly, longtime defender of the Metro Stars and Red Bulls, currently can be heard tonight on Red Bulls Radio. On TuneIn, we'll have the call of the game. When we're back on Seeing Red Live, we're going to go around the league. Let's use hashtag Seeing Red Live, and let's uh, get some conversations going. We'll be right back. Thanks. In transition, Bradley Wright Phillips on the left bank will try and slide it through. Deflected, but one back by question. He will bend one forward across and into the back of the net for Bradley Wright Phillips. He has scored, and we are all even at 1-1. What a service and a takedown on the volley from BWP, who's got goal number six, half of those have come against NYC. Question and Felipe both around this restart. And this time it will be Question who will take it. Good ball into the box, off a of deflection. Grella is there, wide open from the 15 yard area. Abong is there, there's the touch, and it's another goal for the Red Bulls. Chris Duval will put that one in. And the Red Bulls just like that, 
in the first not quite seven minutes of action have taken a 2-1 advantage on NYC. Duval will get his first of the year. It started with Kleschen bending one in. It was deflected down. Grella patiently knocks it across. A bong with a head high and then a right-footed smash by Duval past Saunders. It's deeper than 18-yard line extended. Pushed more towards the right far sideline. Almost acting as a semi-corner. Bending towards the back post. Miazga is there, and it's in! A goal off a restart for the Red Bulls. Matt Miazga, the 19-year-old, has made it 3-1 New York. A beautiful touch for Kleschen, who's got his second assist. We will return to New York Red Bulls soccer live momentarily. But first, enjoy these highlights from the playoffs. We are back at Seeing Red Live before the Red Bulls take on the Columbus Crew in the second leg of the Eastern Conference Championship. If you're not going to be here, you can find it on Fox Sports 1 at 7.30 p.m. But, of course, that's not the only conference championship that's going to be decided today. The Portland Timbers put a hurtin' on FC Dallas in their first leg at Providence Park in Portland. I'm going to say Dan's Portland Timbers because <laughs> he's, he's a big fan. Uh, some fantastic goals, and now FC Dallas tries to hold serve down three goals to one at a... Toyota Stadium that I believe is suffering from he heavy rain and winds for my friends in Dallas. So, Eric, let's start here. Your thoughts on that game and what might happen at the end uh, of the Western Conference Championship? Well, they're facing the same two-goal deficit that the Red Bulls are, but the, the big key there is the away goal, obviously. So, the you know, if a two-goal win here uh, will we'll put us into overtime, here uh, in Dallas, I should say, it, it would put them through with that away goal. So, given that away goal, I do think they'll get it done. Uh, they're a very good home team. They have some very good attacking players. Fabian Castillo, I mean, Tesho Akindeli, Mauro Diaz, you know, the list goes on and on. So, I think at home, I do think they're a better team uh, than Portland, as good as Portland has been. I, d I think they'll get the job done tonight. Dan, Portland is going to get back Diego Valeri, their star midfielder, who is sitting out with the yellow card suspension. Is there any reason for the uh, the lumberjack flannel people out on the West Coast to think this isn't going to go their way? You, you meant in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, yes. No, I, the, the Timbers Army has reason to be hopeful going into the second leg. Getting Valeri back is huge for them. And I think they have enough of a cushion. And the, the key with Portland, you know, if you look back two, three months ago, th this was a team that everybody had written off. They were struggling to make the playoffs at all. And they got hot right in October, bounced up the table, and have basically put a hurting on everybody they've come across in the playoffs. I think they will be good to make MLS Cup. It's amazing when you think about the fact that New York went into Portland and dominated uh, the Timbers side mm -hmm. scoring two goals on Felipe's unbelievable. We had the uh, MLS goalkeeper of the year, which would, would hopefully will be the MLS save of the year, his double stop off the free kick and then of Nat Borcher's beard. Um, you know, is are they a team somewhat of destiny as the as uh, as they believe that they truly are? I mean, this is a team that hasn't won anything other than a spare Cascadia Cup since 1974. Eric, what do you thought? Well, they, they certainly are a very talented team, and as Dan alluded to, they, they're starting to get hot at the right time, which has always been a, an indicator of success in MLS. I mean, there are teams that just barely sneak into the playoffs, all of the Red Bulls in 2008, and, and managed to go all the way. So they definitely have some, some very talented pieces there. Uh, they have one of the best home field advantages in MLS, which spurred them on to that 3-1 win. So it, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they advance. I just think Dallas has a little more firepower, and at home I think they can get the job done. Of course, when, when thinking about who can host MLS Cup, as we all know, if the Red Bulls can get the job done here today, then a week from today at 4 o'clock, uh, right now actually, we'll be kicking off MLS Cup here at Red Bull Arena. Um, the way that the rest of the league is set up, however, if New York falters, Dallas is next in line to host. They would host Columbus next week. And then Columbus, if Columbus and Portland go through, then Columbus will host. Portland, sadly, uh, cannot host MLS Cup for them anyway <laughs> um 
a bit of a transfer rumor this week. There was rumblings out of the British press, uh, Dan, that uh, Bradley Wright Phillips might be heading off season to a loan to AFC Bournemouth of the, of the Prem. Can you? Can you? Uh, Bradley was not so forthcoming. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what this might turn into? Well. Uh, I mean, lots of players have looked into those off-season loans to stay fit and get more opportunities to play, and I think uh, it would be a great story for Bradley, but I think he's pretty focused right now on the task at hand and what's in front of him, so that may be why he's not so interested in talking about it. Any thoughts? Have you spoken with Bradley about it at practice this week? Yeah, I actually did. I, I spoke with him on Friday, both him and Jesse, uh, and he flat out said, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I mean, I, I do think he was very well aware of it. Uh, I think anytime you get, you know, linked to a premiership team, you're going to hear about it. Uh, but I just think he doesn't want to talk about it. Obviously, there's a huge game today. So, I mean, he's going to be looking to, you know, make up that deficit, you know, down 2 nil. He's a big part of that. So he's got, you know, bigger things on his plate right now. Uh, I'm sure it will be something they will address in the offseason if it does come down to it. Um, I think all Red Bull fans hope that certainly we see the best of Bradley Wright Phillips today and hopefully next week as well. Uh, Chicago, which is a team that frankly has been, uh, I guess you could say we're kind of at the nadir of the Chicago fire right now. Uh, New York was able to clinch their second supporter shield in three seasons at Toyota Park at the last game of the season. Uh, the fire put up a bit of a brave fight, but they were the worst team in MLS this year. Nelson Rodriguez, a former MLS player personnel man, has been brought in to be the GM of the club. Uh, and this week they made some, some big waves, frankly. It surprised a lot of people. Uh, Velko Panovic was named their head coach. Uh, Panovic, a former uh, Serbian national team player, a former uh, Philadelphia Union player. Their only season the Union went to the playoffs in 2001. Panovic was on the roster. But his claim to fame, uh, Dan, was winning the, the U-20 World Cup this spring with Serbia, and frankly, Serbia went through the United States in the quarterfinals. They had a lot of overtime, a lot of penalty kick victories, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, they lifted uh, the U-20 World Cup, which was a huge, huge achie footballing achievement um, for Serbia. W what does a signing like Panovic mean for the team, obviously, but also just for the league? I, I think it's a good signing because he was, from the sounds of it, a coach in demand. He had some other offers on the table, so I think he is... Uh, somebody that certainly wants to focus on youth and building a team a, a strong way. And so it's not going to be um, as much of a struggle as some of these other coaches that are coming into MLS this year. Eric, I mean, here's a guy when we, when, yes, he, he's, he certainly was a surprise. Yes, like working with young players. But when we kind of think about coaching legacies in this league, there's the Bob Bradley tree, of which Jesse Marsh is certainly a part of. There's the Bruce Arena tree, which guys like Dave Zarkin, who had uh, previously coached the fire. Um, what does going kind of off the board to a player like kind of a signal for the league in terms of its future uh, for, for the coaching ranks? Well, it was a move that not a lot of people saw coming. A lot of rumored names, none of them uh, ended up being it. But I think the fact that he's played in MLS, I think it'll, it'll help him a little bit knowing uh, the framework, knowing how this league operates. It's obviously much different than anywhere else in the world. And the fact that he's worked at the youth level, he'll, he'll put a, a premium on youth and a team that, that could really use it. They need to start building from the ground up again. Uh, a, a storied club like the Fire, they could really uh, start getting back down to square one and uh, getting back to where they, they were in yesteryear. Well, it hasn't been a, uh, certainly a happy story uh, for the fire over the last couple of years. Um, expansion news, Minneapolis uh, this week, Minneapolis-St. Paul. I guess we should say Minnesota United when yes. we say uh, <laughs> Minnesota, lest we uh, annoy the folks in St. Paul. Um, they're set to be one of three Uniteds in MLS before too long. And this week they announced that Populous, which is the former HOK Sport, uh, designers of uh, fantastic sporting venues around the world, sta stadiums in MLS like uh, BBVA Compass and Sporting Park in Kansas City, was named to uh, be the, the team that's going to be designing their brand new soccer-specific stadium in St. Paul. Um, Eric, we'll start with you. Uh, the, the team has not been officially announced as an expansion team, but yet when you get to this place, this space, this kind of news, you know the, the, uh, the announcement is just weeks away. Yeah, it, it would seem imminent. I mean, there's, there's been rumblings about this for you know, quite some time now, and you know, there, there uh, would be one of those teams that moves up from the NASL to MLS uh, in, in, a, in a different vein. Uh, they, they had some success. Are they being promoted? Well, let's let's not get into the pro rail talk. I don't think our, the show is long enough for that. Yes. But uh, you know, that it's they're they're a good franchise that has a lot of history. They've they've had some great players like Miguel Ibarra, who's you know got a cap 
at the NASL level with under Jurgen Klinsmann. He's now applying his trade down in uh, in Liga MX. Uh, so th- they're they have a, a very strong fan base, and getting the stadium would go a long way into getting them into MLS. Uh, Dan, the, the old MLS kicks used to draw 35,000 fans a game back in the day to the Metrodome to play on that piece of carpet. And I know you're shaking your head because of your uh, your encyclopedic grasp of old NASL history. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, Minnesota has done well both on the field and at the gate. Um, they don't have – they have a team in, in every other major sport. And, of course, they have the Gophers playing in, in uh, Minneapolis as well. Mm-hmm. Is 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 Minneapolis a major league soccer city, and can they be successful? And what does that mean for the rest of the league? I, I think it can be, and I think if you look at the, the league's expansion over the last 10 years, a lot of the success stories have come from cities that you wouldn't have counted as traditional sporting towns. You look at Salt Lake, who have had tremendous attendance uh, for as long as they've been around. Portland, obvious choice, you know, outside of... Uh, the basketball team, what el- and college football? Is there really much uh, else, yeah. sporting-wise? So I, I think they they can be a great uh, addition to the league, and I think they will probably be a little stronger than, say, Miami. Segue. Nice, <laughs> terrific segue. Well done. The last piece of uh, expansion slash stadium news this week, of course, is that Tim Laiwiki, who had been brought in by his friend David Beckham to help uh, run that organization, should it ever come to pass, is that there are, I believe, six homes near the uh, old Orange Bowl site near the new the, the Marlins Stadium, which is where Miami uh, Beckham United, excuse me, uh, is planning on on building, and yet that's holding up uh, y- yet another. Other stadium site that that possibly could ha- house that uh, house that team, uh, Eric. This has been going on. This has been a two-year saga since David Beckham said, "I would like to play in Miami and like to play at the Port of Miami." I'm not really going to talk to the government about that, but I'd really <laughs> like to play there. What is going to be happening down there? Well, it's very tough. I mean, get, getting into MLS, as we all know, is a very long process. Can be arduous at times, but uh, I think you know Don Garber is g- willing to give David Beckham a little bit of leeway there. So hopefully they'll they'll have time to sort that out. It, it'll be interesting to see uh, if if Florida can house two teams, because as we know in uh, if Miami MLS, can house two teams, right? Well, right. I, should, I should say. Well, in, in MLS, you know, 1.0, those both the, the Florida teams were defunct. So if they can, you know, get back because there's, you know, the area in the southeast is very much lacking in MLS. So it would be nice to see a, a team in Miami if they could be successful. Of course, then there's there's already going to be a team kicking off in Miami with uh, Paolo Maldini helping to run the show there in the NASL, the Miami FC. Because we de- can't have enough Uniteds and we can't have enough FCs uh, here in American soccer. Um, is the notion of another team coming into that market going to be detrimental to a possible success of uh, David Beckham's side? I, I think the only thing that's going to be detrimental to the success of David Beckham's expansion side is David Beckham's expansion <laughs> side. Um, and, and empowered by Steve's hot takes on Zubar, <laughs> I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say the, the league should cut and run on Miami at this point. They should find a different market for Beckham. It's been two years Nothing has happened. Could we please move on? <laughs> wow. Uh, so uh, in that case, and we, we've got just a, a, a 30 seconds left here in this segment, if not Miami, what's the next town? Off Sacramento. Sacramento. Yeah. Uh, maybe something like St. Louis. I think they're, they're a team that could, uh, or I should say a, a city that could really house an MLS team. Uh, I, think th- I think it would do well there. All right. The future of MLS here on Seeing Red Live. When we're coming right back, and when we're back, we're going to talk to correspondent of NewYorkRedBulls.com and the Red Bulls, and that's Frank Giassi. We'll be right back. Use hashtag SRLive, folks. We'll get your questions coming up soon. We'll be right back. Now, Sean Wright Phillips trying to respond. Fired it low. Bradley puts it in. The Wright Phillips connection does it again. The Red Bulls right back in front one minute later. What a response from the New York Red Bulls. Well, I don't think anybody can question now what this combo of Wright Phillips brothers are going to be doing for this uh, Red Bull team going forward. Again, Sean Wright Phillips doing a great job maintaining possession. Is able to lift his head, spot his brother inside the six-yard box who one touches it into the net. Jesse Marsh calls over Perinel and Felipe to give instructions. There aren't any timeouts, and Ishmael Elfath is right in his face. Said one more time, if you leave your technical area, I'm throwing you out. I'm just reading uh, body language, and Ishmael Elfath was very clear with his hands. One more, you're out. 
Red Bulls on the attack. Kemar Lawrence played it low and fell to right Phillips, and the Red Bulls are in front. Three games against New York City. Four goals for Bradley Wright Phillips. Red Bulls won. City nothing. And just like that, as we have been speaking about time and time again here in the first 20 minutes, it's outside where Red Bull finds the most success. Finally, Lawrence gets forward on the left-hand side. Serves a great ball, a 45-degree ball. It's Mena who misses that touch. And fortunately for Wright Phillips, left alone, has an easy finish, one touch. Josh Saunders, nothing he could do about that since Mena missed an obvious, obvious clearance. New York Red Bull soccer will return live momentarily. Another turnover against this stretched New York City team. Grella nutmegs Lampard. The layoff went wide. Lampard took him down at the same time. Now Felipe fires it low, and Felipe puts the icing on the cake. He hit the post last week. He's just put the Red Bulls in sole control of New York metropolitan area soccer. Red Bulls 2, New York City FC. We're back at Seeing Red Live before the Red Bulls take on the Columbus crew at 7.30 p.m. tonight right here. At Red Bull Arena, I think the sun's starting to go down. I don't like the daylight savings time. Anyway, it's playoff time. Uh, in our next segment, if you're on Twitter, you can use hashtag SRLive to send us questions, and we will answer them right here next. And right here, next to me, is Frank Giassi, correspondent covering the team since inception, 20 years strong, formerly of the Star Ledger, now at NewYorkRedBulls.com. How are you, sir? Very good, thank you. How are you guys? We're very, very right. pleased for you to join us up here uh, at this fantastic perch. Um, tell us, let's start here. What does New York have to do differently tonight than happened last week in, in Columbus? Uh, I think one main thing is uh, someone has to mark Federico Higuain. <laughs> During the three uh, regular season games, he wasn't really much of a factor. Even in the game they won, it was pretty much long ball, Kamara, and Finley. Last week, he pretty much had the run of the field. And uh, when he has that with his vision and pace, he can look up and has a lot of time, and he can pretty much put the ball wherever he wants and, and set up anything he wants. So I think it's going to be up to either Dax McCarty or Felipe to maybe move up five or so yards, pick him up at the 35 mark or so to try to uh, force him to pass the ball, or maybe even Sasha Klesson coming back maybe five or ten yards to kind of either deny him the ball or maybe uh, dispossess him at that point. You know, we're training obviously all the time uh, during the week, but for the viewers at home, what, what would you see from the team this week coming off the field in their mentality after a tough loss like that on Sunday? You know, Monday and Tuesday they said they were fine. By Wednesday and Thursday they said they weren't fine coming after the game. <laughs> um, so at least they were honest at that point. And, and I can see they, they got rattled after that nine-second goal. I mean, any team would, and it took them a long time to get back into the game if they ever did get back into the game. Uh, and as badly as they played, if they had lost one nothing, I think we all would have been happy with that. But to give up that second goal, that changes everything pretty much at, at the end of the game there. Frank, our earlier guest, Steve Jolly, uh, made a point of – pointing out Ronald Zubar as the guy he's watching. Who are you going to be watching this game as, as the key to the match? I think, um, well, Bradley Wright Phillips has to get into the game, but I think it's up to the wingers to get him into the game. So I think Grella and uh, Lloyd Sam pretty much have to uh, have good games in order for Bradley to get involved. Frank, uh, we're going to have MLS Coach of the Year, Jesse Marsh here. Um, first time in New York history that the New York coach has been named uh, Coach of the Year. Talk to us a little bit about what he's brought to this team all season long that'll help get them ready for this, frankly, really tough assignment today. It is a tough assignment, but right from the beginning, he brought uh, attention to detail. I think every little thing that could go wrong, he had pointed out to the players beforehand. Uh, things did go wrong, <laughs> but at least they knew it was coming. Uh, but his, his film work and his attention to detail, the way he coaches up individual players, they all talked about it. And I think that plus his enthusiasm and energy has really been carrying the team this year. I mean, obviously, the majority of the team pretty, had a pretty poor performance on Sunday. But in particular, Dax McCarty, who's been maybe their most consistent player all year, had a, a season low in his passing percentage, very uncharacteristic of him. What do you think needs to change for him to get involved in the game, be that metronome? And, and is, is being at home simply uh, the ale to, to uh, his concerns there? I think that's it exactly. This team plays much better at home. They have a great home record. They scored a lot of goals here. And I think just getting pumped up from the crowd, uh, an early goal would really help. <laughs> but, um, but I think Dax just having that atmosphere around him, I think he'll bounce back nicely. 
you mentioned the home record. You know, we we were talking earlier about the team having had a bunch of these multi-goal games, 3 nothing, 4-1, <clears throat> 2-0. D- does that history help at all for tonight, or does the team need to just put that behind them and, and try and go out there and play? I think that makes no difference. Uh, they had a few games where they scored 3 and 4 in the first half, but this is the crew and this is the playoffs, and that's not going to matter. Getting two goals from the run of play tonight might be kind of tough. I really think they're going to need some kind of set-piece goal. Um, I can't see the referee calling any kind of questionable penalty kick, and they haven't been that good on free kicks. So I think uh, corner kicks, they've been pretty good on corner kicks. And even without Damian Perinell in there, mm-hmm. they have some height in there with Matt Miazga and Ronald Zubar coming up. And if they can nick a goal off a corner kick and get themselves back in the game, I think that'll be the big difference tonight. It seemed during the game uh, last Sunday, like, like you had uh, mentioned earlier, that both uh, Sam and Grella were kind of negated, right? Um, we saw Harrison, uh, awful for Columbus, throw himself forward. Um, New York also has had a little bit of trouble breaking down counters, mm-hmm. uh, breaking down bunkers, excuse me, this season, right? We saw a number of times when they went up a man that they would get kind of challenged, lots of possession, lots of crosses, few chances. Um, if it comes to that, what does New York have to do to, to finally break down? Because it, it may be that Columbus may go into a shell if, uh, if they need to to survive the series. Well, I don't think the shell will come right away, but I think in the second half, if they're still up by two goals, you're going to see it. And you're right, the Rebels have not had a good record going against teams that bunker in. Uh, they pass the ball around the uh, perimeter of the box. They look good. There's no real probing pass inside for anybody. Nobody's really cutting into any space in the box. And unfortunately, they really don't have a guy who can take a shot from 25 yards or so and put it in the corner. That's been one of the, the detriments and where they miss Cahill and Henri this season. And, you know, obviously, this, this team hasn't really had a, a must-win game this season, I mean, other than the Open Cup where they, against Philly. Uh, but now that they actually face with their backs against the wall, they need to win this game. How do you think they'll respond? Will it be nervy? Will they be able to kind of use that to their advantage because they have nothing to lose? Uh, I think they're going to respond well. You're right. They haven't had one this year. And... Um, if this happened earlier in the season, I, I think they might have been in trouble. But everything they've come through this year, most of it good. And having the home crowd, if this game was on the road, I think it would be uh, difficult. But being at home, um, I don't think they're going to feel the nerves at all. And that must-win thing, they kind of put aside once the game starts. Frank, regardless of the result today, where does the season rank in the club's history for you? <laughs> you know, I, I could say just it's... A, just a tiny question. I could say <laughs> it's, it's one of the greatest seasons in history, and I can also say it's the biggest disappointment in history. Mm. Because, you know, anytime you get this far, it's great. But they got this far last year. So you can say, well, they didn't get any farther than last year. They still didn't make the final. Uh, but everything they've been through this season, the best record, the most goals, the great home record, to get this far and then not get to MLS Cup final, it, it's one of the worst uh, feelings probably for the fan base and, and one of the most disappointing seasons in club history, I would think. Of course, you've got 90 minutes to play. Yes. Maybe 120 minutes to play. Well, yeah, that'd be nice. It <laughs> seemed on Sunday night that New York, um, they, they rushed a little bit. They pressed. Obviously, they were down a goal early, but for long stretches of the second half, when they would get possession, they would go straight. More crosses than I think we've seen in most games this year. How can the team play with urgency but not panic well there needs to be more possession last week it was just knocking balls up it was sloppy passes it was bad first touches they gave the ball away a lot and we're lucky not to give up a couple other goals if you remember that breakaway that they had uh, where Felipe stepped in at the last minute so uh, I think just settling down into the game connecting on passes and I think that confidence builds right away and that's all it's going to take I think now, obviously, we, we talked about the fact that you covered this team since day one, so you would know probably better than anyone the, the history of this club. Goalkeeping has been a, a pretty big strength of this team in its, its history. Goalkeeper of the year this year is obviously Luis Robles. Where do you think he ranks uh, amongst you know the great goalkeepers of this franchise like Tony Miola, Tim Howard? Does, does he stack up with those guys? Absolutely, and um, only Tim won goalkeeper of the year. I know Miola had some good seasons, and he finally had to go to Kansas City to win his <laughs> championship. And uh, was he goalkeeper of the year that year? I know sure uh, for me, so I believe, was defender of the year. Yeah. Uh, another former Metro star. <laughs> um, but he's, he's right up there. And, you know, you look at the games. He doesn't make a lot of saves, but there's always that one moment in the game where he makes the save that makes the difference in the game, and that's what you really look for. And I think that puts him at the top, if not close to the top. Frank, when you look across the roster this year, who's your MVP? If you can pick just one. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody kind of looks to goals. You could give it to Bradley. Um, 
I would probably give it to Sasha Kleston, only because, you know, Jesse calls him the brains of the team. And aside from that, and he had a slow start, and even someone like him coming back into the league had a tough time adjusting. But once he did, everything kind of opened up. He not only had the goals, but he had the assists that really made a difference. And I, I would vote for him team MVP. Frank, in, a, in just a few short hours, there's going to be 25,000 plus here at Red Bull Arena um, for a, a meaningful, probably the most meaningful game of the season. It's going to be on national television. You're a, a veteran of this area's media. Do you think games like this really move the league and, more importantly, frankly, the team forward in the, in the region's sports consciousness? Uh, I really hope so. I was a little bit disappointed. I didn't think there was mentioned in papers this morning. They had a few. Uh, I know the Ledger ran a story, but that was an AP story. Uh, I, I think, think the, the Times, Times had, had, a, had a piece. Yeah. Um, hopefully that'll get people out uh, next year. I mean, if you have a winning team, if the team wins a championship, well, I think right. that might make a big, big difference uh, to get more media to come out next year. Uh, transitioning from 2014 to 2015, obviously the, the, the changes don't really need to be spoken of. They were just massive. Uh, the way that Jesse Marsh came in, when we see it at, at practice all the time, were you surprised at how quickly this team uh, adapted and really took hold of the strategy that he wanted to put in, that, 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 that high press, up-tempo, the all-in mantra that they, that they have? I was surprised, but then after a while you think about it, and this team was so reliant on um, Tim Cahill and Thierry Henry last year, whenever players got in trouble, they just kind of got them the ball and expected them to do their, their magic. Uh, I, I think this year they really enjoyed having more responsibility and being able to do the high pressure and high tempo, things that they're good in, their fitness and their passing ability. So I think they bought in right away, and the success right away made a big difference too. I, I know Mark's going to ask you for your prediction next. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to swerve and uh, ask you to look west where Portland is traveling to Dallas today. Who do you think comes out of that side? Uh, I actually think Dallas can rebound and, and get at least a 2 nothing win at home. Uh, I don't guarantee anything. I know Portland's <laughs> tough, and uh, their home field is unbelievable. But um, I think Dallas c can win that one, yeah. B before I ask you for your prediction, <laughs> this game might end in penalty kicks yes. after uh, 120 mm. minutes, if they get there. Uh, out at the training center this, this uh, week, was the, train, was the team focused on it? They, I know that when we had Jesse earlier, uh, he was talking about, yes, they were certainly talking about who might mm -hmm. take. It's obviously going to take a big effort to get there. Is that a big part of the mix for them this week? Uh, they've been practicing penalty kicks for over a month now. Mm -hmm. um, Eric and I have been watching. Uh, the defenders <laughs> have been the most <laughs> successful <laughs> at taking penalty <laughs> kicks. And we laughed the other day. We could see uh, Zubar, you know, you know, Kamara Lawrence, um, all the defenders. They were really good. Dax, not so good. Bradley, not so good. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if uh, Jesse got a sub late in that second extra time if he put in a defender to take a penalty kick. That would really be something. And <laughs> so, to close out your segment here yes. at Seeing Red Live at Red Bull Arena, your prediction for what we're going to see at 7.30 tonight. <sighs> I'm a little bit skeptical, uh, but I think the Red Bulls can get two goals in this game. Whether they have a shutout or not to make a difference, I'm not so sure about so let me put it that way then. So <laughs> They'll uh, score two at least. But not I don't win know this if, I don't know if they can win this. All right. Well, I'd like to see penalty kicks, though. That might be fun. <laughs> uh, based on what you just said, I'm not sure that would be fun. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Frank, for stopping by Seeing Red Live. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Anytime. When Thank we're you. back at Seeing Red Live, we're going to be taking your questions live here. Please use hashtag SRLive. And the next, uh, next segment is all about you. So we'll be right back here from Red Bull Arena. In transition, Bradley Wright Phillips on the left bank will try and slide it through. Deflected, but one back by question. He will bend one forward across and into the back of the net for Bradley Wright Phillips. He has scored, and we are all even at 1-1. What a service and a takedown on the volley from BWP, who's got goal number six, half of those have come against NYC. Question and Felipe both around this restart. And this time it will be Question who will take it. Good ball into the box, off a of deflection. Grella is there, wide open from the 15 yard area. Abong is there, there's the touch! And it's another goal for the Red Bulls. Chris Duval will put that one in. And the Red Bulls just like that in the first not quite seven minutes of action have taken a 2-1 advantage on NYC. 
Duval will get his first of the year. It started with Kleschen bending one in. It was deflected down. Grella patiently knocks it across. A bong with a head high and then a right-footed smash by Duval past Saunders. It's deeper than 18-yard line extended. Pushed more towards the right far sideline. Almost acting as a semi-corner. Bending towards the back post. Miazga is there, and it's in! A goal off a restart for the Red Bulls. Matt Miazga, the 19-year-old, has made it 3-1 New York. A beautiful touch for Kleschen, who's got his second assist. We will return to New York Red Bulls soccer live momentarily. But first, enjoy these highlights from the playoffs. Hamid directing traffic. Red Bulls with five players to the left of Kleschen at the top of the 18. Kleschen dummies it once, plays it now. Dee McCarty is there, and New York has scored. No offside flag is up. Sasha Kleston to Dax McCarty. And the Red Bulls have scored an absolutely crucial goal here in the 72nd minute to go up 1-0. On We're back here at Red Bull Arena. The sky is growing dark. The lights are coming up. And the hour grows nearer. We're three hours away from kickoff. The New York Red Bulls and Columbus Crew in leg two of the Eastern Conference Championship game. It's Seeing Red Live. We'd like to thank you so much, everyone that's watching on YouTube, watching on the New York Red Bull site, everyone that's listening on the brand spanking new TuneIn New York Red Bull streaming station. We really appreciate it. If you use Twitter, if you're on Twitter, now is a fantastic time to ask us questions about what you think about the game, questions to ask us using the hashtag SRLive, and we're going to read them right here and answer them on the show. All right. So, let's start off with uh, Tolstoy FC in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Longtime fan of the Red Bulls says, do you anticipate any changes to the 11? Eric, why don't you start us off? No, I, I don't. I, I think it'll be more of the same from Jesse. But we've, we've really seen, other than the late season change with uh, Sal Zizzo coming in for Connor Lee, there really hasn't been too much change, other than, of course, when there's a suspension and international call-up and so forth. Uh, but he's really settled in on his 11, and I think that's part of the you know why this team has been so successful down the stretch is that every player knows week in, week out, who's going to start, what their role is. So I, I wouldn't expect anything to change in a huge match like tonight. No, I wouldn't think so. Um, here's Alex, who's ABMVD7, rolls right off the tongue. Uh, Dan, we'll start with you. Any chance of seeing three in the back? I say bring on for Verone after 45 for Zizo for still down. Uh, two or giving up a goal at 2-1. So first question first. Three in the back for this team? They've got to score goals. I, I don't think at the start, but I, there was a game this year, and I can't remember which one it was, but the team did go to three in the back late. I think it was maybe the Orlando game just because yeah. of the deficit. So it's it's not something they haven't tried before. Um, and I think that if the clock is winding down and they need the goals, that you might see a defender get sacrificed. Uh, Sunday underscore sports on Twitter asks, what kind of impact, if any, does Anatola Bong have today? I, I He's a guy that scored a goal against Columbus, sorry. Right, and uh, Jesse Marsh actually alluded to him as uh, someone who could help in, in training with preparing for Kai Kamara, another physical guy, good in the air. Uh, I think you know, you'll see him late in the game if they're looking for a goal. They'll just you know throw everything forward because at that point they'll have nothing to lose. So if this game is one nothing, maybe in the 70, 75th minute, I think you could definitely see someone like Anatola Bong. Uh, they might be lumping balls into the box, try to get, win off a set piece, which the Red Bulls have been very good this year off set pieces. So he'd be someone I, I would look at late in the game. Uh, Michael Anderer, Moosnout, Dan, asks, if, all, if it goes without saying that advancing today will take a team effort, but if one player can carry the team, who is it? And, of course, we know who Steve Jolly says it'll be, and that's Ronald <laughs> Zubar. For, for me, it's got to be Sasha. Um, the team has to score goals to advance, and he's been the key in the second half of the season to springing Bradley, getting the, the flank players like Grella and Salmon, um, scoring a couple of his own. He's going to be pivotal if they're going to turn this deficit around. Eric, same question for you. 
Uh, Sasha is a very good choice, but uh, I, I think Bradley Ray Phillips uh, is uh, another guy that really needs to get going. Uh, he really hasn't had too many looks at goal throughout these playoffs. He had the one goal against DC to clinch it, uh, but that was late in the game. DC were pushing yeah. forward, so th there wasn't really much to that one. So if the Red Bulls are to advance, he needs to get going. They need to get him on the ball early and often. I'm going to say it's going to be Lloyd Sam. Uh, Lloyd, uh, as we talked about with Frank a little bit, has been a little nullified in this game. He has got to get down uh, to the goal line in order to really, really disrupt the Columbus offense. And so I think we really need to see a little bit more from Lloyd um, to make the case in order to uh, for New York to be able to come ahead. Here's Peter Knox, the very cryptic Peter Knox on Twitter, who asks, uh, who would you rather see win in the West? And I'm going to just simply ask uh, Eric because we know that the answer is for Dan. <laughs> I would not mind Dallas winning either. All They've right, been a good right. team. <laughs> well, I, I think... You know, I, I think Dallas is probably the more dangerous team. Uh, I, I just think they're they're attacking firepower, as I've mentioned. You know, Fabian Castillo and Mauro Diaz are two very attack, uh, you know, very talented attacking players, and I think they could cause some problems for a New York team. Uh, but Portland's a very strong team as well. I, I just give the edge to Dallas a little bit in terms of who I would what rather not face if I were the Red Bulls. Oh, that's that's a very interesting uh, twist as well. Who would you rather not face with the Red Bulls? <laughs> I mean, Dallas, uh, by all accounts, is kind of taking the whole homegrown players to uh, to the to the full effect, right? They've started as many as five homegrown players in in, in games this season, and uh, it's really a f phenomenal fountain of youth that served them very very well. So terrific players. Um, away goal rule on Twitter asks, when does Verone come on? Do you see him having an impact today, Eric? Let's start with you. Yeah, I do. I, I think uh, he's shown that off the bench he can provide a spark. Um, he's he would be the type of player that can really open up a match uh, if you know Columbus does try to bunker down. You know, which I would assume they would if they're trying to hold on to a lead late. He's someone you know who can take someone on with the ball. He's creative. He's very quick. So I, I would again I would see him as a, a late game sub. I uh, you know I don't think he's going to start, but I think he can come on and, and make a difference and, and try to open some things up. Also, when you consider this match might go 120 minutes, so as we say, a late game sub could wind up having a very very big impact right. on the game. Right. Dan, for you. I, I think we'll probably see him around 60 minutes in, and I think he can make an impact when teams are bunkering. Look at the D.C. second leg here. Um, I think that was pretty telling. But he has to have that connection and the, the communication with his teammates around him. We've seen a couple of instances this year where there's been a chance for a goal or an assist, and it's gone wrong. So we can't have that tonight. No, we certainly can't. Uh, Julian and all of the ISC who are watching in the British Isles tonight, uh, Metro 68, will our defense cope with our own high press tonight and back up our forwards, right? You talk about uh, two, frankly, uh, pretty poor mistakes by the back line led to those two goals. What are we going to look to see tonight, Eric? Well, I, I think Steve Jolly even alluded to in his interview and how important it is for the outside backs to get forward because it really opens things up and it, it puts, puts pressure on uh, Columbus's defense. So uh, if, if Zizzo and Kamar Lawrence can get up the field and can join the attack well, uh, it'll go a long way into making up the deficit. The only concern there is they got caught up, out, you know, caught up high up the field, which has happened to this team in the past. A counter could be deadly, and that could sp uh, spell the end for New York. Well, and that rolls right into our next question from Nick Russinello, who writes, How important is it that the Red Bulls score first today? Also, how do you like the Red Bulls' chances if the game goes to extra time? I would say probably pretty paramount that the Red Bulls score first today, Dan. It, it would be. It's not... Absolutely critical. They did win 3-1 at Yankee Stadium. Right. But uh, they would obviously need a fourth goal in right. this case. Um, yes, they, they, it's not just getting the first goal, but getting it early. They want, I think they want to unnerve Columbus the same way that they were shaken. Maybe not first 10 seconds this time, yes. but we'll see. All right. Um, here's John in Garden City that says, or asks, what literally that's who he is john garden yeah, city i might know <coughs> what's the oh, okay <laughs> what's the first half strategy look like today knowing that conceding a goal has deadly consequences we saw dc come in here uh in their last home playoff game and not really play with a whole lot of urgency going forward even though they needed to score and obviously couldn't give up a goal N new york's not going to sit back though are they no certainly not uh, i think they'll they'll commit numbers forward early and often I don't think they're going to play afraid. I, I obviously, committing, or sorry, I should say conceding a goal would be a, a, a huge mountain to climb, but I don't think they're going to be afraid to push numbers forward. Uh, like Dan said, getting that, that first goal is huge, but getting it early is even more important. So I think uh, right from the get-go, they're going to go after him. All right. Um, Steve Hoffman, Steve Hoff on Twitter asks, who off the bench is going to make the biggest impact tonight? Dan, we'll go start with you. 
I mean, Verone's an easy choice. Um, beyond that, I mean, it depends on the game state, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if we if a, somebody gets a red card on either side, you might see a tactical switch, um, whether that's defensive cover if it's a New York red or a, an extra attacker. So it's hard to say. I think a bong, you know, he's been out of action for a while. It would be good to see him come back strong um, and make a difference tonight. But really, anybody who gets called into this game needs to step up. For sure, for sure. Uh, Ghouls Bro who says, who has to perform tonight for a repeat of a 4-1 result versus New England or a 3 nothing at home? I mean, for me, uh, and we've talked about it and we've had this question a number of times in different ways, um, we've mentioned Sasha, we've mentioned uh, Lloyd Sam. For me, Dax has to step up. Um, this, you know, as we know, is uh, as the captain of the team, he's got to lead by example. There was a great piece on MLSsoccer.com that talked about how Dax, during the first leg, was everywhere, was doing everything. He was doing everything from marking uh, Iguain to pushing up to you know take throw-ins, doing everything he possibly could. He's got to play the hard-nosed game that he needs to. His passing percentage was either easily 20 points lower than any other game this year. We haven't really talked about Dax tonight, but what, what are your thoughts on uh, on the Ginger Ninja and what he has to do here? Yeah, I, I don't see him having a game like he did in Columbus. And, you know, he's he's one of those utility guys that he seems to do everything, as you alluded to. Uh, he's the shield for the back four. He can start an attack out of the back. Uh, but I think a lot of the, the reason that he had such a poor game was that, you know, Federico Iguain was running wild. I mean, they, they, they couldn't stop him. He was popping up everywhere. And a lot of that is, is on Dax's shoulders to shut that down. But I think at home, uh, he'll obviously be a little more comfortable. The Red Bulls will be the ones dictating play this time around. And I think that'll go a long way. If you want to get your question read here live in the press box, f hi, 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 atop Red Bull Arena, it's a great time to tweet at us using hashtag SRLive. We've got about five more minutes of your tweets, so please send them along. There's one here from some guy, Empire of Soccer? Oh, I, I see that. Don't Dave Martinez, him. Empire of Soccer, who uh, has a popular website from what I understand. Um, does the crew play it safe and bunker, or does Burhalter press for one early? Or later, does that matter? Uh, as we talked about in our last segment, New York has had challenges breaking down bunkers. I can't imagine with the attacking talent that Columbus has at their disposal that they are going to play a defensive game. Um, given the way that New York also defends against the counter, I do not. I, I cannot imagine that Columbus isn't going to try and, and hit New York there. Dan, let's start with you. How, what, do, what do you think we're going to see from uh, the crew coming out out of the blocks tonight? I, I don't think we're going to see them bunker quite the same way that DC did. I think they'll probably play a little cautious. You're right that the, they might try and hit on the counter. I think they do want that goal to swing the momentum their way tremendously because um, if they get that one goal then they can just shut the game down and probably walk out of here with a Eastern Conference chance, chance. Yeah, yeah moving on to MLS Cup Eric your thoughts yeah I, I'd kind of piggyback off what Dan said there I, I don't see them shutting shutting up shop right away because trying to bunker for 90 minutes against this team just it won't work I mean this team eventually will get a, a goal or two uh, and that's not their forte. They're, they're a better offensive team than they are, you know, on the back four. So I, I don't expect them to come out and just, you know, try to manage the game. I think they'll they'll try to go toe to toe with New York for the first, you know, 20, 30 minutes, feel out the game, and uh, if if they can manage to keep New York off the scoreboard, then maybe they'll get into more of a defensive posture. Here's Ninth Virtue who asks, "Will we see a nervy dump the ball in from the wings Red Bull side from the start, or will we play our game?" That's a very interesting question, considering I think uh, dumping the ball in from the wings is something that traditionally New York has done pretty well. I mean, they're not necessarily going up the gut every time. No, I, I don't think uh, in, in terms of uh, nerviness, I don't think there will be. Uh, we, we even we, we talked to Jesse and a couple of the players. I asked them specifically about that. Are their nerves going to this game? And the fact that they're down 2 0 almost can work to their advantage in some ways uh, because they'll have nothing to lose in terms of we're at home, this is our stadium, we're going to push numbers forward. And if they can get an early goal, it'll completely turn the tide and uh, see if they can get things on their, on their terms. Absolutely. One last tweet before we go to break and bring on Jesse Marsh, head coach of the New York Red Bulls. Here's Thierry Henry, not. Not Thierry Henry, who says, if we don't advance today, is this Red Bull season still a success? Would you go changing the starting 11 in the second leg? Dan, let's start with you. Well, we already talked about the starting 11, so yes. we'll, we'll, we'll pass on that. But I would say that regardless of what happens tonight, the season has been a success. I think this team had been largely written off at the beginning of the season, and I think they've toppled expectations left and right. 
Eric, anything to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd completely agree. I mean, considering where this team was at the end of 2014, we've documented you know endless times the turmoil that this team was going through, and to see them get to this point uh, to, to show how quickly they've they've taken the system and implemented it very well. Uh, you know, getting a supporter shield for the second time in three years is a huge accomplishment. So, you know, regardless of what happens tonight, I think it's a success. I think any time you set a, a team record for wins, wins at home, have the goalkeeper of the year and the coach of the year in the league, it has to be considered a success. When we're back on Seeing Red Live, we're going to have that MLS coach of the year, and that's Jesse Marsh of the New York Red Bulls. We'll be right back. Now Sean Wright Phillips trying to respond. Fired it low. Bradley puts it in. The Wright Phillips connection does it again. The Red Bulls right back in front. One minute later. What a response from the New York Red Bulls. Well, I don't think anybody can question now what this combo of Wright Phillips brothers are going to be doing for this uh, Red Bull team going forward. Again, Sean Wright Phillips doing a great job maintaining possession. Is able to lift his head, spot his brother inside the six-yard box who one touches it into the net. Jesse Marsh calls over Perinel and Felipe to give instructions. There aren't any timeouts, and Ishmael Elfath is right in his face. Said one more time, if you leave your technical area, I'm throwing you out. I'm just reading uh, body language, and Ishmael Elfath was very clear with his hands. One more, you're out. Red Bulls on the attack. Kemar Lawrence played it low. It fell to Wright Phillips, and the Red Bulls are in front. Three games against New York City. Four goals for Bradley Wright Phillips. Red Bulls won. City nothing. And just like that, as we have been speaking about time and time again here in the first 20 minutes, it's outside where Red Bull finds the most success. Finally, Lawrence gets forward on the left-hand side. Serves a great ball. We're back at Red Bull Arena, seeing Red live hours before the Red Bulls take on Columbus Crew in the second leg of the Eastern Conference Championship. And we're here right now, Red Bull Arena, with the MLS Coach of the Year, and that's Jesse Marsh. How are you feeling today, sir? Good. How are you guys? We are good. We're good. ready. You ready? Right. Yeah, we're ready to go. Excellent. Yeah. What has to happen differently in order to have a different result from what we saw last week in Columbus? Well, you know, I mean, there's a few factors in there. You know, certainly a better start would serve us well. Uh, but I think our ability to really put the game a little bit more on our terms, physically command the midfield a little bit more, they beat us up in the midfield. And we yes. were a little bit sheepish, I think partly because we were carrying some yellows and we didn't want to be overly physical and get caught losing a guy for the second leg. Uh, and then flat out sharper. We need to be sharper in the midfield, sharper around the goal, more dangerous, more aggressive. And listen, all year long at home, that's what we've been. So we'll see that again today. And this is the, obviously the fifth time you guys are going to be facing Columbus this season. You guys know each other pretty well, mm -hmm. and, you know, lots of different mentalities in, in both those games. Is there anything left that, you know, either of you guys can throw each other to surprise each other or is it kind of status quo? Well, for me, it's, it's more the levels at which we can execute. Right. I think we know what they try to accomplish. They know what we try to accomplish. If I were to give us a positive from the Columbus game, Columbus never got in their rhythm. Right. And so we never really got in our rhythm, but they never really got in their rhythm either. And and if we could have been a little bit sharper in certain moments, we could have potentially taken that game over in the, in the later stages. But because we weren't, uh, we, we let things slip. So. You know, at home, I think now that we have another gear to go yet. We have another level to achieve. I'll tell you, training this week was one of the best weeks we had of the year. And I think because in all ways, I didn't have to tell them how disappointed that I was and that we all were by our execution in the last game. And so right now they've got revenge on their minds. They've got uh, success on their minds. And in every way, they're going after it. Jesse, Columbus played pretty direct last week. It's the same way they got the team uh, back in that 2-1 win on, in Columbus before yeah. earlier in the season. How do you slow down that attack given what we saw last week? Well, you know, I think they did a combination of things. I think they wanted to play more, but, but the game didn't play out that way. And sometimes when you play in these big games, they never settle down. So that one didn't really settle down too much until maybe some the middle part of the second half. 
for us, I think now one of the wild card factors is as we start to take them out of their rhythm, Iguain is the one guy that can roam around, find the game, be inventive. And we didn't do a good enough job of, of uh, keeping track of him and making it hard on him. So that will be one of the keys today is not only just to take their team out of the rhythm of how they like to play, but really make sure that Iguain isn't floating around in the midfield and finding the ball. It seemed last week that Dax was in charge of making sure that he knew where Iguain was, which I think changed a little bit of his game going forward. Um, how can you assign that really, really important job to just one guy, or is it going to be a team effort? Well, I th you know, the ways that Iguain was able to find the game were mostly when we lost possession. So, again, the fact that we weren't sharp in the midfield and we didn't win a, enough for the 50-50 and second balls in the midfield meant that then they were to recover balls and Iguain's floating around. So we've got to be able to close that gap between the midfield and the back line when we have the ball so that if we do lose it, he can't just now start to find balls. That's going to fall. A lot of that responsibility is going to fall on the back four and their ability to do you know, you guys rest defense, okay? Yes. And then also for uh, Dax and Felipe to be looking around and making sure off their shoulder that that's a priority. So we don't ever give specific um, roles and say, this is your job on the day. It's their ability to think on their feet, use our philosophy, use our tactics, and now identify and problem solve while we go. They'll, they'll, they know that's a really important factor today, along with some of the other things that we did that were successful, but we'll have to do that at a very high level because one play can cost us. Throughout the playoffs, I mean, we've obviously talked a lot about the yellow card accumulation and, and how that might change things, in particular for your center backs and Zubar and Miazga, making them maybe a little more tentative. Now that that's thrown out the window, does that maybe free them up to be a little more physical with a guy like Kamara and help shut him down? Yeah, I think it sets up to be a real physical game on both sides. Uh, everybody has a yellow card to give, but... You know, if it, especially if the game winds up going uh, uh, 120, then those yellow cards can lead to red cards. Right. So there still has to be some discipline, but also an understanding that being physical is important, putting out fires is important, and that taking a good yellow card can help the team at the right time. They obviously know that as well. They will employ that as well. And I think because we have the ball more, you'll see them collect more yellow cards probably on the day than we do. But the ones that we might collect would be in transition defensively. Jesse, we had a lot of questions from fans about what Columbus was going to do, whether they were going to try and put in an away go early, whether they were going to bunker the whole time. If they do bunker, how do you break that down? Because this team has occasionally struggled when teams sit back over the year. Well, uh I think it behooves them to be aggressive, right? Because that goal means uh, they give they pad themselves uh, quite quite a bit more. Um, their ability to do that obviously opens up the game a little bit and and now uh, allows us to find space. We've gotten better at teams sitting back as the year's gone on. And so whether you want to talk about Chicago, Philadelphia, D.C., we've still managed to find ways to break them down. And then, you know, our ability to mix up going in the middle, finding spaces in, in, in the wide spots, you know, getting good service, getting numbers in the box, recovering the ball again. It's, that's about the tempo and the rhythm that we create within the game. And then also our ability to be dangerous on set pieces, which I think has grown as the year's gone on. So there's potential for this game to look like that. Um, but I think there's also potential for them to come out and play in a very Columbus manner. When we talked to you last time, you had mentioned that uh, practicing penalties has been something that you guys have been doing in, in practice for some time. Uh, what, do you, what do you like what you see in terms of the team, in terms of being able to uh, convert? And, and that might come into play at the end of the game today. Well, we have a lot of data now because <laughs> they've probably each taken about 15 shots over the last month. Uh, you know, I, I think just like anything, practicing the penalties, I think, will benefit them when it's time to take them. Uh, but what's more important, I think, is just the familiarity with stepping up at the spot, knowing even that sometimes the goalie knows where they want to go. So if they're shooting against Luis, if they're shooting against Kyle Rainish, they know where they like to go. But then it still comes down to, can you put the ball where you want it to go in the goal at a better rate than, than yeah, the goalkeeper guys. can save it? Uh, and, I, and we've seen Luis actually get better as the weeks have gone on in terms of saving more balls and, and now putting himself in more situations where he's, he's been reading things and, and trying to make the save. So if we go to penalties, I like our chances. I like our takers. I like our goalie. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think that that benefits us. And, I, you know, I like being at home. 
It, just looking at the numbers, as you alluded to, the home and away splits, you guys are obviously a better team here at Red Bull Arena than on the road. Uh, you guys play the same tactically, though, pretty much week in and week out. What do you attest that to, the reason that you guys are so much better at home? Is it just being able to implement your will a little bit easier? You know, I've never been able to figure that out. <laughs> Even as a player, you know, you, you, you were, I was always on teams that were very good on the ho at home. We were good on the road, but never nearly as successful as we could be at home. And I don't know if it's the familiarity with the arena or the stadium or if it's the energy that the crowd gives you, that your fans give you, you know, the, the routine of being at home. Uh, so I can't answer that question, but I will say that playing here is something special. It really is. It's, it's, it's partly, um, there's so many factors. It's partly that the grass is always in amazing shape, like mm -hmm. the field's flawless. Uh, the arena's amazing. There's such great energy. The fans, uh, you know, when, when our fans are on their game, I think they're the best in the league and the environment is the best in the league. So our players love playing here. I love being a part of this club and, and uh, coming to home games here. Every time I roll up, the juices start flowing. So I think our entire organization feels that way. I know you've said this in different places, but if you could just share with our audience your thoughts on taking home the award. Uh, this week for Coach of the Year and what that means to the guys in the locker room, the whole yeah. organization. It's so, so little of it is about me, really. It's about everybody at this club. I mean, here we have a bunch of people behind the cameras <laughs> even that have uh, put, poured their hearts and souls into what this has become. And that's one of the things that I think gives us the best chance to be successful today is that there's such energy behind what's going on with this club right now, with this team, with these players the that has uh, you know i'm i'm just proud and happy to be a part of it and and any part that i can play to continue the momentum continue the the foundation of what we're building here and everybody i think has sensed from january on that there's something special here and everybody just wants to commit everything they have to it so the award to me uh i think rewards a little bit of everybody for all that hard work that's a great place to leave it. Jesse Marsh is the head coach of the New York Red Bulls. will be taking on the Columbus Crew in leg two of the Eastern Conference Finals in just a little bit. Jesse, best of luck tonight. All right, guys. Let's get them. We're going to close up this SR Live when we come back after this short break. Stay with us. In transition, Bradley Wright Phillips on the left bank will try and slide it through. Deflected, but one back by question. He will bend one forward across and into the back of the net for Bradley Wright Phillips. He has scored, and we are all even at 1-1. What a service and a takedown on the volley from BWP, who's got goal number six. Half of those have come against NYC. Question and Felipe both around this restart, and this time it will be Question who will take it. Good ball into the box, off a of deflection. Brella is there. Wide open from the 15-yard area. Abong is there. There's the touch, and it's another goal for the Red Bulls. Chris Duval will put that one in. And the Red Bulls, just like that, in the first not quite seven minutes of action, have taken a 2-1 advantage on NYC. Duval will get his first of the year. It started with question. Bending one in, it was deflected down. Grella patiently knocks it across. A bong with a head high, and then a right footed smash by Duval past Saunders. It's deeper than 18 yard line extended. Pushed more towards the right far sideline. Almost acting as a semi corner. Bending towards the back post. Miazga is there, and it's in. A goal off a restart for the Red Bulls. Matt Miazga, the 19-year-old, has made it 3-1 New York. We're back at Seeing Red Live. This is, we're going to be closing out the show during this very, very short segment. We hope you enjoyed what you heard from us. If you're watching on the Red Tubes, uh, the Red Tubes, the Red Bulls YouTube channel, we're doing it live. If you're, if you're watching on, uh, on the Red Bull site or on YouTube or you're listening on our TuneIn streaming station, we really, really appreciate it. 
We do Seeing Red every single week during the MLS season, and we hope to have not one but at least two more shows to go before we wrap it up. Um, Eric, <clears throat> we had some terrific guests today. Is there anything you took away as we kind of have closing statements and predictions before the Red Bulls take on Columbus? I actually think what, what Steve Jolly said earlier in the, in the segment about the, about the outside backs getting forward, I, I, I think that's a, a big part of uh, today's game in, in trying to put Columbus back on their heels because I think obviously getting that first goal is huge and just how quickly they do it will dictate this game. So if they can put them on their heels from minute one and commit numbers forward without getting exposed at the back, obviously, uh, that'll go a long way for New York in this one. And your prediction for today? Oh, boy. All right. Well, I, I do think New York is capable of scoring two goals, and I think they will. I just think that pushing those numbers forward may put them at a disadvantage at the back. So I think the game ends 2-1 for New York, but that would see uh, the Red Bulls out of this one. All right, Dan, now to you. Your thoughts on what we learned today as well as your prediction for tonight. The, the main thing I've taken away from today is that the conditions are right for this team to thrive. They're not worried about yellow cards anymore. They've had a great week of training. They're going to have a sold-out arena. Um, and they're playing at home where they've been strong all year. So I, I think it's as good conditions as you can get for the side. Um, in terms of a prediction, I'm going to only go so far as to say they will win the leg. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I think we learned a lot, a lot of fantastic things today. Uh, obviously, Jesse Marsh, extremely confident, has his team ready, prepared, knows exactly what they have to do. I appreciated the comments both uh, from Steve Jolly and well from Frank Giassi in terms of um, you know, little nuances of what we're going to see here. I'm going to uh, go out on a limb and say this game will end 2-0 in, in favor of the New York Red Bulls, which will, of course, produce extra time. And what happens in extra time uh, will be a complete toss-up and a coin flip. And if we get to penalty kicks, of course, even more as well. But we hope to certainly be back with you next week to talk about the Red Bulls in MLS. Cup. We'd like to remind everybody, if you have yet to leave for the arena, I know it's two and a half hours before game time, please try to come a little bit earlier. There are significant security measures that are in place, uh, significant bag restrictions in place tonight. Please go to NewYorkRedBulls.com and check on exactly what is allowed. Uh, gloves, hats, scarves, thermals, and hand warmers are definitely allowed, and your voice is going to be needed in a big way tonight. Dax McCarty earlier this week says he is hoping for a hostile crowd at Red Bull Arena, and we would absolutely agree. For my very good friends Dan Dickinson and Eric Giacometti, we'd like to thank everyone who was a guest on Seeing Red, everyone who tweeted us live. We'd like to thank Jason Baum and the whole New York Red Bulls team for having us here at Red Bull Arena before the Red Bulls take on Columbus. I'm Mark Fishkin saying thank you so much for watching and listening to us on Seeing Red Live. Have a good night, and let's go Red Bulls.